You're very welcome to the Keith Andrews Show. Joining me this week is Mr. Kevin Kilban. Kev, thanks for joining us. How are you doing, Keith? All good? Very well. Just want to give people a reminder. You can watch it on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. Later in the show, we had a little chat earlier with AP McCoy. We we're going to chat through the papers. We we're going to chat Champions League. And news just breaking. The Ireland squad's just been announced. We were wondering when it would be. Um, five new players in the squad. Kieran O'Hara, Declan Rice, mm. thankfully. Daryl Lenehan, Derek Williams of Blackburn Rovers playing very well in the league one at the moment. I watched them on Sunday against Euro Club Kev Wigan. And Ender Stevens, who's also had a very good season at Sheffield United. So yeah. some new new blood in the squad. It's very yeah. inexperienced, young. Well, there's one or two. Dar- Daryl Lenehan, you said you, you saw him at the weekend. I wouldn't know too much of him. I haven't seen seen a lot of him. Of course, I would have seen the Preston lads that are in for, for this one. But out of the new, the new players that's, that's been called in, uh, Declan Rice, we would have seen a lot this season. Mm-hmm. You and I have spoke about him regularly. and same, he, Well, any defender that's playing or any mm. player that's playing in the Premier League now, you, you're going to have to be given a shot, aren't you? That's the way it is. I thought Josh Cullen might have been in with a shout as yeah. well, that he's had a bit of game time, but maybe his lack of experience in game time probably went against him. But it's it's exciting, isn't it? I think that's what it is. There's a, there's a lot of excitement, I think, because there's so many different stories, there's so mm. many different people we can talk about that we haven't necessarily seen before. And I think I think it gives supporters a lot of optimism, I think, when they see the freshness on the squad. It's yeah. common sense. I know we've seen uh, Wes and Darren Murphy retire. Is it common sense, maybe? Or maybe players undecided, the likes of John O'Shea, Glenn Whelan. We see Darren Randolph's not on the squad. I don't think his position's... No, uh, in doubt at all. Something else we should mention, like Seamus Coleman back in the squad, which is which is great. To yeah, see our captain. Um, bit of common sense in terms of the the elder players, maybe undecided. You think where they're going to go with their future? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I think it gives a chance for for Martin O'Neill to to have a look at all these players. Let's see how they come in, and I think it's. I always maybe I could maybe think back to the time when Mick McCarthy first took over and he had a lot of new players all coming in if I think there may be the Czech Republic game which would be the famous mm-hmm. one when we had Mark Kinsella Robbie Keane Damien Duff all new lads coming in together I think it does help when there's a few new faces that yeah. all come in together I think that'll help the newer players coming in Matt Doherty who you and I would have spoke about as well I think he's one who's been excelling deserves his place definitely definitely. Yeah. definitely and he gives an option on either either side he's got three right backs and three left backs yeah. Seamus obviously come back in the equation so it's and now Matt Doherty who can't play he's playing wing back this year right wing back but he has played left back and then he's gone three left backs yeah. and Stephen Ward not in the squad which I'm sure that's yeah. nothing to, to read into but he has gone with Ender Stevens, uh, Derek Williams who's left sided centre half stroke left back Yeah. Um, and who's your own on? Do you think there's a potential for three at the back now? Yeah, he's got an options that he ha- we do have options I suppose that we Greg, Greg Cunningham's played left wing back mm. certainly Matt Doherty's played r- playing mm. right wing back got Seamus we Coleman that can, could do, can that. do that job Cyrus could easily do that job yeah. as well so there's potentially you know you've got you've got Declan Rice as you say there um, Shane Duffy I suppose as well within the Kieran Clark mm. there, there's, there's certainly options defensively yeah. or tactically how we could how we could line up I suppose going into that mm. into that turkey game the only game. thing is top end of the pitch though do you they're quite light aren't we we've gone with Shane Long Scott Hogan and Sean Maguire Sean Maguire has timing has been yeah impeccable hasn't it he has and we spoke a couple of weeks ago about that was his driving ambition in terms of when he was injured to yeah. try and get back for for this game in the, in March for the, and he burst back onto the scene a mm. couple of goals on Saturday another goal uh, the other night and also his teammate at Preston who you would have seen a little bit of yeah Alan Brown I'm delighted he's gone in the squad as well I have to say but stay on the striker from the moment yeah. it just highlights the lack of options that we yeah, have yeah it there. is but we know that we, we've spoken about it so often where is the next Robbie mm. we've been waiting for the next Robbie Keane for 10 years let's be fair I'm talking from a pure out, yeah. out and out pink. goal scorer yeah yeah Sean Maguire, of course, Scott Hogan has come into a little bit of form uh, in the last few months himself, managed just to get himself back amongst mm. the goals. But Maguire, I mean, I know, I was at the game against Wolves a couple of weeks ago. Alan Brown was excellent on that day again, actually. against the, He's been the playing as a 10 for Preston, hasn't he, in the main? He has, but Jordan, Jordan Hugel's gone. Yeah. So, obviously, Jordan Hugel, big move for him uh, to West Ham. And what I'm led to believe from when I was down there is, look, this chance now is for you. You're going to play it. You can play as a 9. That's where... He's spoke openly. That's where I want to play. That's yeah. where I see my position. That's where I, I can. I think I'll score goals. You only need to look at your two goals against Bolton at the weekend. Yeah. Poacher's goals. That's yeah. what he can do. And then he can score the goal that he scored midweek against Bristol City. To get himself true. free. Job. So I think I think he'll play Keith. Yeah. I think I think he's going to start in long term now. I think he sees he? him as a he's number ahead nine. Of, um, Scott Hogan. Ah, oh, it's a difficult. He was one. going back to November. 
October time, wasn't he? In the, yeah. in the squads. Yes, he was. And I think, I mean, you probably look at it, if you said it a year, 18 months ago, when it was still doubt whether Scott Hogan was going to declare for us, you probably would have said if, if Hogan does declare, he would be yeah, immediately be ahead shot. of him. But now Maguire, given the form that he's in mm. as well, it, it's it's certainly in the balance. I'd probably just edge it slightly towards Maguire on current form and, and how he's playing yeah. and maybe the momentum that's the with him at the moment. That he has as well, exactly. Um, but similar ish, aren't they? For anyone that hasn't seen a yes. lot of them, you know, in terms of build, the way they play, they're very clever, they're bright in terms of their movement. Yeah. They're good finishers, they, f- they can finish in different ways. So I suppose there is a you know, if you go back to what you said about playing the three at the back, could potentially have two up front, Shane Long, and one of those. But you are missing a real physical presence up there. Yeah, which Martin does like. Yeah, we exactly. haven't got that at disposal now. Obviously, with Darren Murphy retiring. Yeah, exactly. John Walters struggling with fitness. You've got, you've got. We know what we get out of Shane Long. We've mm. got the pace. We've got the. We've got. We have got aerial power to an extent. We don't necessarily have the. We don't necessarily have that real goal scoring prowess, but. He has produced when he's had big moments in games, Shane Long. He's just not necessarily done it consistently enough. But he can work channels. He can hold the ball up well. He can do the things that's required of him if he was going to play as that lone striker. It's just maybe I, I, I would have maybe always felt I think Shane Long's probably best performance he's playing for Ireland has been in the two. Mm. So, but I, I, if we're going to play with it, if we're going to play with the three at the back, say a three-four-three system, come three. 5 one, 1 system however we're going to go about it if we are looking down that line then it's going to have to be you would imagine first choice would be Shane Long mm. and it's up to uh, Hogan and Maguire to put to him under that, pressure yeah, yeah. that's the way it's got to be look at the midfield then for me okay so we've got Alan Judge coming back into the squad that's a big um, that's a big boost for him yeah, you know, he had he, a terrible look didn't he coming into the Euros with that that injury he had in the March friendlies was an opportunity for a lot of players memory saying that was Switzerland Shane Duffy excelled yeah it was a massive opportunity for Alan Judge. He yeah. would have been a young lad at Blackburn come true when I was playing there and I loved him to bits. Yeah. It was just like an energy bunny. Just just so focused, so driven, would always affect it. I felt so, so sorry for him. Yeah. Just talking about a move of maybe going to Newcastle. Newcastle. He probably Didn't agreed happen. at one stage, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it's 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 great for him. He's back in and around that at Brentford. He's not playing fully. Yeah. But this'll be a great bit of boy for him. We've got good options in there, but the point I'm getting to when you look at Judge Hurahan, Hendrick, the way he plays as a as a ten for Burnley, Harry Arthur, uh, you know Liam Kelly in particular, yeah. they have to play in a particular way. So we've yeah. already highlighted the top end of the pitch. We haven't got that physical presence now. With that midfield, with the front players, we've got to play. Yeah, yeah. We have to get I the ball so. now more. I think so. I think that's the way it is. And again, you know, you you, you certainly wouldn't want to maybe second guess or try to maybe get into Martin's head see how he's going to go about it but it looks to me there are options to play with the three yeah. there certainly are options to do that and that then does give as you say maybe ex- an extra body in midfield mm. to do that we, we you can actually go that way yeah. if that were to be if that's the case then if you're looking at maybe a Liam Kelly it's maybe an opportunity an opportunity for someone like Liam Kelly who can play you know, Kane, who can play. Yeah. These, these are ball players. Yeah. That's the thing. And of course, then you're going to have you're going to have your Jeff Hendricks. You're going to have your Harry Arters. And even I mean, Connor, Connor Harrahan as well. You look at him and what he's doing at Villa and how how he's producing. Now he's mm. scoring goals from midfield. When have we last had a goal scoring midfielder? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, perhaps you should have been he's, you should have been there that keeps going that goal scoring <laughs> midfielder. No, but not on that rain. But he's he's done really well in terms of going from Barnsley, going to a huge club like Villa huge pressure on the manager huge pressure on the players to produce just assume they're going to get promotion yeah. hasn't always gone to plan I have to be honest they're not particularly great to watch they just grind results yeah. out but his performances if you go back to the, what he was like at Barnsley when I seen him at Barnsley I'm thinking he is a he's a match of the day player Yeah, set pieces big dirty diags quality left foot but in terms of nitty gritty of playing centre and field and particularly in a two I wasn't sure he right. had that when I look at him now, and when he got the armband at Barnsley, gets the move to to um, to Villa, I see a mature player. I see someone who wants it. Mm. I see someone who's really evolved and nailed it down. And then that left foot is still there. Yeah, like, yeah. He can score goals if he is given the license to. Yeah. If we do play with one. But you're still going to be de- Keith. When are we going to? And, and and I say when have we got a goal scoring midfielder from um, playing for Ireland? We're never going to get the opportunity to get bodies forward. Mm. We have to be solid in a majority of games. We we have to play a certain type of way, maybe at times, to get results. We may have opportunities where you can have, where you can have a midfield play that can make that burst mm. forward. But 
in fairness, we, he might he's going to have to be. That's the, if he's going to play in a Martin O'Neill side and he's going to play in in, in in an Irish team in general, no matter who's the manager, mm. he has to play a more disciplined role and he's yeah. got to learn that I think role. He's getting that though, careful. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. No, that's yeah, what I'm saying I really to you. So do. I think he's evolved really. You're well. you're seeing you're seeing that a lot more from yeah. me uh, than than me. So. You know, I'll I'll certainly take take your word on that. But when I have seen him play, I've been I've been very impressed with his ability yeah. to run off shoulders. You say the, the yeah. left foot that he's got anyway. It's one, I think. Isn't it? And you only need to look at his career, what yeah. he's done. He's had to go down to the bottom. Yeah. He's, he started at the yeah. top. He's gone down to the bottom, and he's worked his way so back. He's got up. something about him. He's got balls. Yeah, yeah. of course he has. Yeah. That's exactly what it yeah, is. Absolutely. No, I think it's exciting. I think it's. It's a nice opportunity for them to create a little bit of positivity, play an exciting team. If it is going to be a three at the back, whatever it's going to be, give yeah. some ideas. But first and foremost, cap Declan Rice. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's right. I mean, again, it's still not going to actually Nailed secure him, down, is it? It's not going not. to... But, it, but if you do play, surely, come on, he's yeah. not going to do an Alex Bruce on this, is he? No, I, Alex Bruce or... Uh, or um, oh, what's the latest Sean Scannell? Yeah, well, what's the other one as well? The lad at Villa. I think forget his name now. That's what he's gone what's out of my head. Oh, Jack Grealish. Jack Grealish. Yeah. Oh, well, he, Alex Bruce played. Didn't yeah, he? yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But Alex Bruce was never going to get another cap, though, was he? Let's be fair. <laughs> um, um, I think you look. No, you look at. Uh, I, I said what I would say with Declan Rice though, as well is that I've ne- and, and I heard uh, Joe and Dan were talking on the uh, on the evening show a couple of nights ago. You never got that feeling, did you? You never. I, I've not had that feeling. Declan Rice is ever going to. He's going to. Fi- he's going to what? He's going to go and look for something else. Gareth Southgate has spoken about him, saying that yeah, he's on our radar. But I've never had that feeling that he's going to. Actually By all accounts, okay. Speaking to people within the FAI, underage and all the way up, they never had that feeling about Jack Grealish. That he was very much focused on, yeah, and nothing was going to detain. He loved playing. I had that feeling when, I, when I started to see. Well, when just when I started to see agents involved and and the talk about him, because yeah. he took a year out of international football, yeah. and I was like, ah, come on, yeah. gone. I mean, honestly, it was ridiculous. It, it yeah. was ridiculous. I know what you I mean thought. in terms of the characters of they do seem very yeah. very different. That I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm a bit clouded. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just actually thinking. Um, because I haven't necessarily heard any sort of talk coming out from yeah. that, that it might be the sort of thing with us. Or he might be the sort of lad that's just literally that's it. Now I am fully focused yeah. on on playing for Ireland. But I do genuinely believe. I think that's the case. I yeah. do. I do think that anyway. Right, we're going to move on. Bit of um, Champions League chat. We'll, we'll kick it off in Paris. You were there doing the night with Dave McIntyre. Uh, what, what did you think going into the game PSG against Real Madrid obviously PSG would have all to do they are missing Neymar yeah. what, what were you thinking I, I, well back Real Madrid so I have to, <laughs> <laughs> did you? So to say, do you know why I fa- honestly I, why I fancy them and it was there was a lot of talk from PSG before the game Unai Henry the coach talking about what they'd learnt last season from um, from, the, from the Barcelona the Barcelona game yeah um, talk about you know how positive they are yes they've lost Neymar but there was even talk that there was a bit more togetherness within the squad that Neymar wasn't without playing. Neymar. With, yeah, without him, it wasn't necessarily. We were, were looking at an individual yeah. to to, uh, to unbreak the, the uh, team, or yeah. to to break the deadlock. But I just I look I, I was thinking I hadn't seen the team at this stage, but mm. I thought. Real Madrid, with their experience, what they've done over the last few years in big games when they've needed to, mm. they just do enough. I thought they might have actually lost on the night, but I I was thinking that might, yeah, but get through. I yeah. thought two one defeat but yeah. they'll do enough to get through be surprised and with their team selection definitely when he, start, when he starts Asensio and uh, yeah. Vasquez the two wide Cruz, men and then leaves uh, Cruz and Modric, Modric fail, Isco all on the bench that's the midfield four that you think yeah. would ne- necessarily would yeah. start that game Casemiro who, Casemiro um, and the two centre halves in Varane and Ramos were just simply outstanding yeah. it was just it was just a masterclass how to see an away performance through in, in any game the, those three in particular were absolutely brilliant even Kovacic who came in and he did a bit of pressure on him mm. I suppose from a defensive point of view I think he did a great job but for all that Zidane supposedly went in to try and boost the camp give the players that bit of a lift and almost be that figurehead to say I tell you what go and play lads mm. I think Zidane's proving what how tactically he is astute, he astute is. At and the, making the big calls in terms of leaving without a else. doubt without a doubt mm. I mean I wouldn't necessarily have thought he's going to come into that game I mean there was doubts over Modric and Cruz fitness wise yeah. anyway but certainly Gareth Bale given the form that he's in he has yeah. been playing well Domestic. says a lot to me perhaps that Where Bale, Bale be could be going year. yeah of course he does we know that but to make that call and then play it as solidly you know forcing them wide because yeah. all all PhD wanted to was play narrow, try and go central. Couldn't get Cavani in the game. Yeah. Di Maria was just awful on the night. Yeah. Mbappe didn't have his best tonight. Wasn't able to get on onto the ball. <laughs> and then 
because they played Morata, Morata sitting at the, at the base of the three, he wasn't in the match. They kind of killed mm. Morata because all his passing was all simple five, so ten yard side passing. Was backwards. Side was backwards. Yeah. There was no penetration yeah. from uh, from PSG, and I thought it was great. It was a great performance from them, outstanding yeah. throughout, really. Yeah. We're just hearing as well, Tommy's let me know my ear, Nathan Murphy's at the press conference with Martin O'Neill. We'll go back to the Declan Rice. Just been asked about Declan Rice. And Martin's answer was, I wouldn't presume anything. Yeah. So he's been named in the squad, but he's saying there's no guarantees. So Well, you may be right with your saying then. Maybe. Um and maybe he could try and bat that question off. I think he's probably been honest there. That's probably what yeah. he is being honest. Personally, You'd like to think that that, sort, that conversation is being had now between Martin O'Neill and Declan Rice themselves, picking up the phone and saying, "What do you want to do? Are you going to be committed to us?" Because You'd be naming them, though, would you? If there wasn't well, that that's the thing. In place. Uh, yeah, but you, maybe you, you, maybe you've highlighted <laughs> something to me there where I'm kind of a little bit naive on it. Where I'm saying we never had that feeling of, of Jack Grealish, and all of a sudden, well, Martin mentioned Jack Grealish in this press conference apparently as well, and, and he did reiterate the point you made. Even though he may well play against Turkey, that's obviously yeah doesn't. Nail him down to us. Yeah, well, he doesn't want to get it's himself. Worrying, though, isn't he, he, he doesn't want to get burnt, does he? I, you know what I feel on this anyway, Keith. And if 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 you're actually playing under twenty one level, and if you're playing, if you're committing to playing at that level for Ireland, as far as I'm concerned, you're Irish and you've got to play. You you should be playing. You should be having that commitment. Mm-hmm. You don't need your head turned further down the line. Yeah. If that were to be the case, then I'd be well. It, it, it's it's a joke anyway. The Greeley situation was a yeah. joke anyway, as far as I was concerned. But fair play to him, he made his decision. That's it now, as far as I'm concerned. Greeley can actually still play for us. We know yeah. that. But that's it. He's gone. Yeah. I think Declan Rice in accepting this call up because the conversation must have been had. He's committed to us. That, that's the way that I would see. Well, it. And, and, and Keith, so. If that if if anything else if anything else happens around that, I'd be extremely disappointed. Yeah. I really would. It, that that would be that would be a massive kick in the balls. That I think. Yeah. He's. Um, I've been trying to get him on for a while. I met him at a game a few months ago when he started to get involved. The Forest team had a chat with him, brief chat with him in the tunnel and doing a bit of your journalistic networking. Of, yeah, just a bit of networking. Yeah, go on. The, uh, Good the man. Young guns. And uh, he said he would come on, and then I've been half in touch with the press officer. And for obvious reason, over the last few weeks, it's been put on yeah. the back burner. Put on the back burner. But it, Keith, Garrison, you know what? I'm not saying to you, me. but like I know I'm not saying that, but I think I think it'd be the ideal one to, to come out to, and say to come on with you, especially come on and speak to you, and just to say, and it, just get it clarified. Yeah. It, and he's still a young lad; he's still learning, mm. and there is a reluctance of of the press officers to put the young lads yeah. out. We know that we've yeah. we've seen that throughout. It, it'll be more their in house stuff that they mm. would do. Stick stick to the the, the club's media. Control, it's easier absolutely. to get some sort of experience yeah. in doing that. But this might be the ideal t- time, especially if you say get him on with you. Have a chat. It's a it's a ten or fifteen minute chat and clarify your situation. Yeah. What you want? Are you Irish? Do you want to play for Ireland? Mm. And I think we'd all feel a bit better off off that. Really. Yeah. Well, hopefully that comes in the next. Well, we're going to find out very very. Well, exactly. Soon. And he's, now, he's, exactly. He's going to be out. He'll he'll be he'll be speaking. I would have thought to the FEI's media. He'll be speaking yeah. to the media over here yeah. as well. There'll be interviews yeah. to be had with him. It just depends on if he wants to shy away from it. He, mm. he doesn't want to answer any of those. I mean, I, I can hardly say the difficult yeah. questions. He might, he might see them as difficult questions. Yeah, because, Renee. Well, that's that, all that, it is. It's, well, you're right. It's not particularly difficult. You know, what I'm he's a very about, articulate yeah. young man. I think he's we- very well tuned. And that's what we're talking about. The difference between him and Jack Grealish, I think, is vast. Yeah, really do. So, look, fingers, toes, everything crossed because yeah. he's, he's, he's certainly got the potential to be top, top notch. Yeah, I'm with you. To- and again, he's potential there. You're looking at the, our options yeah. we, to have a three. You can play as a holding yeah, midfield if exactly you're playing in a two. That, yeah. You know, imagine that having, say we're playing against one of the better teams yeah. and you've got him in front or him in front of a, of a Duffy and a Clark, yeah. whatever it would be, a good solid base to the yeah, side yeah. and you can actually build around that, can't you? So, there are, if you play the th- as a three, you've got we've got good options. Yeah. I mean, Shane Duffy's been, he has been yeah, outstanding this season, hasn't he? He's, yeah. he's, he I, I've always thought he's a great defender, mm. but I think now with his leadership skills alongside a youngster like Declan yeah. Rice, he's, he's now becoming that 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 uh, main player yeah. in the side, and he he's can help him. Johnny, isn't he? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Done, isn't he? He is. Um, right, come on, we need to get off this. I broke. We, we need to get back to Champions League. Uh, we have got AP McCoy coming up in a little bit. Uh, Spurs Juve last night. I was on Man City against Basel. Man City were nowhere near. Ten changes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Torre looked like he was tarring caravans. What's the story with Torre then? Gone. Torre gone, that's it. Gone. Yeah. Officially gone. <laughs> and I sincerely hope they're not paying him 250 grand a week still. Yeah. Well, I think, did he take gone, a cut? Kev. Did he take a cut? He's still in about 150, I think. You isn't see he? one of the goals, right? He loses it in midfield. Then he goes in a maze to try and it was like a Benny Hill sketch, like trying to get the ball yeah. back, and he's blowing. 
he's gone on alone yeah. so look he's had a great he's, look he's had a good innings yeah. he, let's be honest but move on move on but a key issue for them now is going to be Fernandinho missing Gundogan in possession obviously brilliant can do that role all day yeah. because they go further in this tournament and they get tested defensively and look they made 10 changes last night but he's still talking Laporte 50 odd 60 million yeah. John Stones 50 million you know it's how were those two as a partnership last night? Poor, poor, yeah, yeah, poor defensively. Stones, for all the talk about him at the start of the season, again in the first maybe a dozen games, he's he has I been he, I since he's come back from injury. Yeah, I really do. I think he looks like he's feeling it. The usual price tag built up. What the, what did the English press like to do? Yeah, not yeah. come back down. But um, listen, on on Spurs, Juve. I fancied Spurs last night. I know you, you fancied Juve. Um, I I, did, I knew the tie wasn't dead. Yeah. I mean, Spurs should have won this. The two legs. You're looking at it. What 180 minutes? It's probably 165 minutes of dominance. Mm. That's how it was. The 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 dominant. So what is it? Inexperience, naivety. <sighs> I think Roy Keane spoke about the fact is I'd, I'd seen a few quotes from him saying. Um, Spurs needed to play like Juve when they went in front last night. They can't. No, I know. I know. They can't, though. That's the it's not in their DNA. But they can't sit in, they can't soak Well, they the should be able to, though, Keith, or shouldn't they? Do you not think they should you be able to? When, when I understand that you're going to go. Game, even. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm totally. That's not how they play. It's not, it's not the manager's style. I'm not going to say philosophy, but I've just said it. <laughs> so, anyway. But it, is, it isn't what Pochettino wants to bring out in his players. Mm. But, Keith, there's got to come a time, and you spoke about this, and we were talking about it the other week when you were talking in relation to the midfield lad, um, Pogba. Pogba. You've got to know your role. You've got to be disciplined. Mm. Why can't you just sit? It's things that we would have learned as we're progressing yeah. through through uh, through the systems. Yeah. Every one of those Tottenham players would have been up against it at various levels, mm. at various teams they've been at. Why can't you just say, let's see a spell through for 15 Collectively minutes? Be able Collectively, to, yeah. get behind the ball and be solid. Compact. And the, and the ultimate one is what the, all the better coaches or the so called better coaches at the moment would always say yeah. attack is the best form of defence. Let's go and press. Yeah. But can't always do it. Juve love that. You don't yeah. need to look at Juve last night. Yeah. Juve were quite happy just to defend and see it through. And all of a sudden, there was two moments. Mm. I mean, the ball was, it was a game changer, but the ball was quiet actually. He didn't have a big, big impact in the game, but he had the big moment in yeah. the game. And he, he was through one on one. And he scores and he finishes them off and then they sat in late on and Harry Kane hit the post. They were really unlucky with that. And they put Tottenham uh, so they put Juve under so much pressure. But that was just the case that was the same um as it was for yeah. what as I said, the hundred and sixty five, hundred and seventy minutes anyway. But they are getting to that stage now, aren't they, where they need to produce something for, for we we were in, in the studio last night, myself and Shay were in the studio, and as soon as we heard that they gone one up, one one, two one, Shay at the end of it said he felt that the that the masters of failure. Now I think that's harsh. Yeah. But I can see where he's coming from in terms of Pochettino, this team, the age they are. We can only talk about it for so long before they actually produce yeah. something, a trophy, you know, get into a final. But it, we, you know, because it's crunch time at that football yeah, club, yeah. new stadium, where the players go, the contract situation, Daniel Levy, they've got some top top individuals. Mm. But really, I, they should have seen to go a goal and up. Yes, last night they should be able. That's what, that's to what I mean. That they, they have to have it within within their heads to think. Well, I'll tell you what, lads, we don't necessarily need to keep. We don't need to keep on chasing this mm. game. Let's force them into a situation that they're not necessarily going to be comfortable with. We're going to have to come at us. Look at the pace they've got where they're able to counter yeah. with. Look at the ability they've got yeah. where they can actually sit in. You've got ball carriers. Mm. You've got ability full to... Backs from full full backs, back areas. Bomb on. Son, obviously. Tally. Why, why can't they do that? Yeah. That's the thing. And I think you've... I would always... I would always like... For all so you question Pochettino then in that aspect? In well, terms of the tactics that he's very one-dimensional. He won't... It's great out. to watch. I'm not denying that. It is great to watch, and and it's fun to watch. And you, I, you, they could get to a situation with Liverpool when they let on the top. Liverpool, you'd fancy Liverpool to win it with the attacking talent yeah. they've got. But Liverpool could do exactly what Tottenham mm. did last night. You know, they got Man United this weekend. You know, Mourinho's going to shut up shop. Really? But Liverpool have got players where they can actually sit deep. Yeah. But I take, come on then, yeah. come at us and let's hurt you on yeah, on, on the, the counter, counter attack. attack. Why can't you? Why can't you actually change your tactics in, in, in the lead up to a match? Why can't that be the case? And I, I would always look at a coach, Mourinho in fairness to him, no matter what you think of him, Mourinho is a, is a, is tactically an astute manager and the fact is that he can actually change a system for in, in a game. He do can actually change a system. Yeah, do you think he's still as tactically astute? Well, I spoke to AP an hour ago or so, we were talking about Wenger. Wenger hasn't evolved. <laughs> yeah. Sir Alex Ferguson evolved which is why he was so successful what about what about Mourinho because he's getting some serious criticism in terms of how to perform the style of play is he as tactically tuned in as he was maybe 
five, ten years ago. Well, he knows how to win games, doesn't he? He knows how to get results. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not looking at a Palace result of the night where United come back because mm. United were bad on poor. the night. They were very, very yeah. poor. So, but he knows as well as I do. You manage to come back and get a result mm. like that from 2 0 down, it, it, it means yeah. something within yeah. the squad. Oh, it momentum, brings a bit yeah. of unity w- yeah. within there. Um, has he evolved? It's, it, it is still the same Mourinho, but the same old Mourinho will work at that level. It would work at Champions League level. Against Sevilla last week, it was such a dour watch. But they've got the result away from home. You could see them beating Sevilla now next week and go through against Liverpool. I fancy Liverpool to win the game, actually. Mm. But I, I, I could also see Liverpool going there. Man United doing a job on them. Exactly, and coming on stop. Mourinho could... play like he's playing away from home. No problem doing that at Old Trafford. Um, How much ambition will he show? Because they are getting frustrated, Kev, the United fans. There's no doubt about it. With yeah, the attacking yeah. prowess they have, the introduction of Sanchez in, in January, yeah. Mata, whoever it is, Lukaku, Rashford coming off the bench, even Jesse Lingard at times looks very, very good. They've yeah. got some serious talent at the top end. Yeah, the they, should be, they should be doing it against the Palace anyway. They should yeah. be actually going to Palace and actually producing or letting those lads uh, letting those lads mm. loose let them go let, let's go and see us go and beat a team really well away, certainly away from home particularly mm. at Old Trafford though as well so I mean I mean, I go back to your original point there has he, has he has he changed and has he is he still tactically astute Mourinho I, I just think he's never ever going to change his ways and his way would probably always get the better of a side that goes and presses like a Pochettino's mm. or a Klopp because you, because you just got the amount of, because you've got so many bodies behind the ball, it's difficult to break down. Yeah. Like they did against Arsenal early on this season, where they sat deep. Arsenal dominated the ball, and they were devastating they on the counter attack. The counter-attack, That's what they've got within them. Yeah. So, for all that, I think United have got potential to actually go mm. to a Barcelona and do do exactly that. They could do that. Yeah. Quite, quite. It's quite conceivable that they could do that. Um, going off a little tangent, I can't make it next week due to work commitments. I'm nearly as hard working as this fella. Uh, <sighs> well, is that the Thursday, Cheltenham? You're going to Cheltenham? No, I can't go. I said. Oh, I'm, I am going to Cheltenham. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excited. Yeah, I've got. Did you go every year? I didn't go last year. I couldn't make it last year, but I went the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I go most years. Yeah, most years. It's I first went in '97, actually, or '98. It was the first year I'd Where signed. I'd West signed Brom. at West Brom. It was only down the road from yeah. West Brom. And you know, you had many a time at Cheltenham when you were at Wolves, allegedly. Um, but um, no, so we went. This the first year I went, and I got the bug for Cheltenham then. And I'd, be, I'd been a lot since ninety seven. You went to yeah, races the first time you went to Cheltenham, or not really? No, I was. I was. Yeah, I was probably through my dad. I, okay. I wasn't majorly, but I, you know, I'd been to Haydock. I'd yeah. been to Aintree. I'd been to you know some of those yeah, yeah. tracks up up around the northwest of England. Yeah. That's where I've been. How but different it, is Cheltenham though? Uh, People struggle to. Because I, I don't, I'm not really into horse races. I have to yeah, be I love honest. It. I, I do, know I, you do. I am well into it yeah. now, yeah. Like, I could easily go to Cheltenham, watch the odd race, but the atmosphere in Cheltenham is just unreal. I'll just get, I'll, I'll, have, to get, I'll, have, I'll have to get me, uh, me tips up for you, one or two Go tips on, for here now. No, 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 I'll, do, I'll give you that in a sec. But what, what I'm saying there is um, the, what, you, what you're asking me, the buzz of Cheltenham. Uh, the buzz of Cheltenham is that it's actually the, mo- the I mean, I'm not going to choose, I'm on the Thursday, but. The first day is probably the best buzz. On the Tuesday, the yeah. morning you arrive, you get a bit of breakfast in Cheltenham, you get you get over to the track nice and early, and the buzz is yeah. just building. It's electric, isn't it? It is, it's just an absolute yeah. buzz. And it'll be the same on Thursday when I get there yeah. as well. I'm flying in from Dublin Thursday morning, I'll get there nice and early, a bit of breakfast in Cheltenham. Have you ever gone to town Dublin before? Have you always been in England to go to it? Done no, this will be my first so that'll year. That'll be a different dynamic. This will, yeah, well, exactly. That, there's probably going to be yeah. a lot, a lot of Irish on the yeah. flights in. Yeah, that's a good shout. Actually, I've never done that. Good crack. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, usually yeah, I get the train over. down from uh, from Manchester from yeah. Stockport, where it would be on the way down. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So, um, go on, give us a couple of tips. Oh yeah, I've got on it right. Um, well, I'll be, follow- I'll be following a few of the Elliot ones. Anyway, fancy sizing John in the Gold Cup. That's six to one at the moment right. as well. That's the. Of course, you'll be looking at the Apple Jade and the Sam Crows from, from Elliot, but um, last race on the Friday, last race, last day, 33, 40, 40 to one shot, three stars. That's your one okay. there. That's the one That's the one tip of you. Back at each way, three stars, good word. Yeah, that's your one. That's, that's your money back. When you've lost a so few quid... you give a money back guarantee on that? You've or lost or? it. You've, no, well, no, of course not. There's a few people not happy in the office here with a couple of bits you've given over the last few I'll weeks. I'll tell you what, Keith, off, off, some off, a one euro, off a one euro profit... Yeah. Let's be, they, these lads are actually they're, they're paying for mortgages and everything off what I'm giving them. I'll tell you that now. But um, yeah, I tell you, and I tell you in the uh, in the cross country as well. 
Elliot has two horses. Gordon Elliott has two horses, but the one I, the, he has Tiger Roll. We all won a few quid on Tiger Roll last year. Uh, Cause of Causes, who's going for its fourth time, uh, fourth time winner at Cheltenham. Mm. Cause of Causes or Tiger Roll, they're going against each other, unfortunately. Mm. But the, both those have a great chance. Eleven okay. to four and five to one. I'll go Tiger Roll just for uh, nostalgic um, views because it okay. won, won a few quid last year. Yeah. I'll take you over next year. We should give a little. Can we do the show from next year over here, Tommy? Is that? That's a yes. Let's yeah. speak to Jay. So we'll Let's speak to we'll yeah, speak to Jay. Jay agent. A bit busy at the moment, I think. But anyway, that's, oh, that's yeah, another story. Yeah. All right, stay with us. We have got AP McCoy interview coming up. But first, we want to get back to Tuesday, back to Paris. Kev was there with Dave McIntyre, and check out Dave chomping on a protein muffin. Well, it was Joe. Honestly, you're looking to for the start of the game. Unai Emery, the PSG manager, spoke of a, of a team that was going to set his team up to really go and attack Real Madrid. And you know what? The first half was so dour from you know from a spectator's point of view. They, they offered very little. And you know, I've got to give credit to, to Real Madrid how they set up. I, I thought Ramos and Varane with Casemiro and even Kovacic in front, that four really provided a real platform from a defensive point of view for Real Madrid. But PSG offered so little. Given what they have spent and given how Unai Emery uh, talked them up at the start of this game, they offered so little throughout. Well, as soon as picked out work rate, I mean, it was like he was summoning uh, Gary Neville in a way he was just talking there about the fact you know you, they're jogging back you can't jog back you have to sprint back at this level yeah. and he signed off by saying they've got their manager the sack this evening that's what they've done he thought it was a disgraceful yeah. performance well it, it looks that way whether or not he'll get the opportunity you know, Emery, Emery, you know, Emery, to see the season out I don't know mm. but tonight was very much it showed how far they're behind Europe's elite That's what that was the thing that was probably telling to me uh, I don't know how much you lads in studio watched of the game but just the way that Real Madrid you know you look at Real Madrid and you think, yes, Ronaldo scored a great goal tonight and how solid they are, or how good they are, sorry, from an attacking point of view. But tonight it showed that they can actually go away in the big games, defend if necessary. They're very, very disciplined. And I think tonight it showed that Real Madrid are right amongst it again. I think they're right in with a chance. So I'd like to say we have a very, very special guest in the studio. Busy time of year for him, Mr. A.P. McCoy. A.P., thanks for making the time. I know it's a... Pleasure bit manic at the moment and the, the build up to uh, Cheltenham you're getting pulled here there and everywhere how have you been? Good good could be worse Keith could be working for a living <laughs> something that you and I will never know <laughs> exactly, about exactly yeah <laughs> exactly so what have you been doing with yourself bit of punditry uh, yeah a bit, of, bit of punditry I do a bit of um, stuff on ITV racing um, for the bigger days working yeah. four days at Cheltenham um, for those yeah I'm keeping busy the golf is, is a little quiet at this time of the year I'm, I'm probably more of a fair weather golfer today, but I believe, but supposed to be playing at the K Club today but the weather I was quite pleased about that because I <laughs> something I never did when I was riding I ended up out in places in Dublin last night that I probably shouldn't have been but um, <laughs> you wouldn't have called it a very professional if I was uh, if I was still a jockey but you were out with a mutual friend of ours but we, we, which will remain no, nameless we won't, we won't, no, we won't, no, we won't stitch no, him no, up but I was, I was supposed to be there but I was too busy preparing for um Good night. Me you this morning. It's very, still have an air of professionalism about me. That's very professional, and you didn't miss a lot. We were very quiet. We was went it? home quite early. Yeah, quiet one. Quite early in the morning. Listen, um, I want to. So you've 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 been relatively enjoying the the break, or is it still not quite um, sitting well? Have I been enjoying the break? I you know I got to. I was very lucky as a jockey because very dangerous um, sport to be in. I was able to walk away um, on my terms. You know, was I ready for it? You know, had I had enough racing? Probably not really, not really. But it was the right, you know, it was the right thing to do. I was nearly forty-one when I retired, which was a good age for a jump jockey. I'd been lucky enough to be champion jockey for twenty years, and um, I don't think there would have ever been a right time. I often look; it is a dangerous sport, and I've seen colleagues being fatally injured and suffer severe paralysis and different injuries that. Um, you know that make me think how lucky I was to walk away. But at the same time, I used to think some. I wished I would get. I wished I got frightened by it. Sometimes I wished it. Did it never frighten you? Not really. You know, not not really. I, I just I knew the danger of it. I knew there was two ambulances coming behind me. I knew it was going to end up in them at some point. But the, you know, in some ways, I kind of I miss winning morning else. But in some ways, I miss that the the danger. I miss the adrenaline of the danger. I miss. The riding in a twenty odd runner race at Cheltenham Festival and maybe falling in the first three or four and you know sixteen or eighteen or twenty horses galloping over the top of you and you actually get up off the ground thinking God I got away with that yeah you know and it's mad to and then sometimes when you're on the ground and you don't get away with it 
you think, well, do you know what? I ride between 700 and 1,000 horses every year. You ain't going to get away with it all yeah. the time. You're a bit unlucky. Yeah. But as I said, I'm well aware that some of my colleagues weren't lucky enough to get away with it. And there's days in the wear room as a jockey that I'll never forget because of that, you know? And it is, you know, it can be life changing for you, your colleagues, and for your families as well. So, but it was a great way of life, a great sport. Was that always the way you wanted to go, right from a small lad growing up in Ange? Was it always purely horse racing? Yeah, look, was it purely horse racing? My younger brother was All Ireland champion boxer. You know, he, you know, I suppose that kind of came from. You know, I think as in the north, you came, you you grew up as you watched the likes of Alex Higgins. You played snooker. You you boxed because of Barry you McGuigan, icons, or yeah. you know, you had you know icons. I I remember going and getting a, a football signed um, when I was eight in, a, in my local town where I felt by Pat Jennings you know because he was the Arsenal goalkeeper and they just come back from the World Cup you know um, you know Liam Brady was someone that one of your heroes yeah you know and someone I'm actually friendly with now and I've played golf you know so with quite a bit so that's you know there's a lot of things but was it always horses and yeah I think from about the age of eight or nine even though I'm not from a horse my dad was a, a joiner a builder and you know my mum we had a shop at home you know we had a four sisters one brother none of them have ever sat on a horse but there's a picture of a, me and a horse when I was two you know so I think it was kind of it was meant Something to be there. and I left I left home when I was 15 Keith you know I, I, I kind of left school a lot earlier than I should have done I used to you know I pretty much didn't go to school my last year in my fifth year of secondary school I decided end of September I went for about the month of September and then yeah. decided I didn't need to go anymore but I used to cycle 15 miles every morning to the late Billy Rock's yard to ride a horse and I used to cycle 15 miles back from the age of 13 mm -hmm. you know so that, that was it was from then it was serious that yeah, wasn't it, was serious, it was yeah. proper and I knew like I left home when I was 15 and obviously I left home thinking that if I'm any good at this I won't ever live back at home and I didn't want people to think that oh he's back home yeah. he went for six months I didn't want to be a failure I didn't want to I left failure. the exact same age as you 15 yeah. and similar similar ages in terms of going over to England and that would have been one of the biggest things that I didn't want because I would see footballers go over and come back and come back yeah. and the one thing that grated on me at the time was they used to have these parties and going away par yeah. going away parties for what you haven't you haven't gone anything. anywhere yet yeah. Yeah. yeah and that would have been the biggest the fear of failure yeah. in terms of giving up not quite making it that not embarrassment I suppose but yeah. not wanting to come back with your tail between your legs I yeah suppose. pretty much I, I was like that and you know you do make those sacrifices my younger sister was barely even five so I didn't really get to see her growing up mm. um, but I didn't want to come back with my tail between my legs I didn't want to be a failure you know but I I you know, I was quite an ambitious person and I I was going to try and give it my best and if it didn't work, like there was nights when I left home when I was 15 I cried with homesickness and I thought I want, I do want to go home, I was in my room mm. and you think, God, I, I, I'm not sure I'm strong enough that, but I, I'm such a stubborn person I thought, you know what, I'm going to stick with it and I really, really wanted to be a jockey, you know, and that was, and I, and you know, you kind of want to be, you, you want to be successful as well, you want to set yourself goals and my career didn't really start I wasn't an overnight success by any means I was I worked in Jim Bulger's for four and a half years and you know I thought I was capable and all that but I only rode nine winners in the four and a half years that I was there you know which is, is not you know it's it would be enough to make someone give up and I didn't at that time when I was leaving gyms I kind of didn't particularly like my time there but I know that it made me I know that he was so it was good grounding good great grounding you know great grounding and I was glad that I stuck it out for those four and a half years because when I did get the opportunity I had the grounding to cope with I had you know I, I you know I had, I had the experience um, of you know I wasn't you know, I wasn't someone that was just walking in and being a success after six months yeah. you know it, it, I, I, it made me appreciate it even more it made me work harder for it mm. Uh, because I was getting this opportunity and I was getting it a little bit later, you know, so um, But I think in life, I think you I've been very lucky that I worked for very successful people And I've liked the people that I've worked for as well, you know, that's I been think important that's, to you, hasn't it? All the way a, through. That's a big thing. You mentioned Jim anyway. Bulger, obviously, yeah. Martin Pipe, yeah. all, JP after that. Yeah, all, all high achievers, you know, with high expectations, you know they expect the best from you they expect the best from themselves and they expect the best from you yeah you know you're not just going to be tagging along behind them you have to go with it and work with it and 
and um, and if you've got ambition, they will make you better. Yeah. We were just chatting off and we'll get on to a bit of football chat later, but we mentioned about you maybe not being a team, you would have struggled in a team environment and certainly in certain teams these days. Like Definitely in my oh team, God. Arsenal at the moment, <laughs> I definitely struggle. But, but with that, that's interesting to see that, that the people that you worked with in terms of JP, mm. you know, they have to have the same ambition Oh yeah. In terms of where you wanted to go to, because you were so driven, you, you've already said you're so stubborn in terms of the way you want to go about it. You know, I often say that those people, those people who are ambitious, like they, they uh, they're never really satisfied. They all, you know, their ambition is never satisfied. They always want a little bit more. They're looking for that perfection that is never going to be there. You know, and and that's what those people that I work for are, are like. That you know. And, so and when then, were you like that from? Them? I, I suppose you know I. When it, well, I, I often think now for people who went to Jim Bulger's, if you had ambition to learn, you would learn because things were done correctly. Right. You know, he told you how you know that how he wanted things done, and you either listened or he kept telling you. And the quicker you listened, quicker the less you, you, the less you needed to be told. Yeah. Um, Did you always agree with it at the time? Not really. No. No. You know, I was. You know, I def definitely didn't agree with it. He was like a bit of a schoolmaster, yeah. and you know, um, but I do look back now, and and he has ingrained things in me that. I know we're, we're so correct in the way if I was doing it now I'd want it done yeah. as well and it was the same with with Martin Piper with or with JP you know they, they set standards and they, they they have expectations and you know they're very ambitious you know and they 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 want to be better and quicker and faster than everyone else you know they yeah. want to they want to try and get that edge that makes them different than, than how do the, they differ the how do Martin and JP differ um how do they differ? You know, Martin Pipe, Martin Pipe, for those that don't know, was the most successful jump trainer of racehorses there ever was. Um, his dad was a bootmaker, never had any dealings with racehorses at all. Went racing one day with his dad, decided, wanted to back a horse and decided that none of them looked fit enough. Came back and told his dad that he was going to train a racehorse because, you know, because that was what he was going to do. And his dad says, "You know nothing about racehorses." And he decided that he was going to be a racehorse trainer to prove a point to his dad. And he read up books about athletes, whether it be Zebatek or whoever it was that, you know, who was the the Olympic athlete who won at different yeah. distances and how he intervally trained himself and. You know, and it was a to prove a point to his dad, who was a very successful man, mm. because he told his dad told him he couldn't do it. You know, obviously the stubbornness again. Stubbornness yeah. again. Obviously, he got the enjoyment from, you know, from being successful and wanted to be more successful. And then, but the more you want, the more the I often say it, the more the the need becomes a greed, and and you want everything. You yeah. know, and that, you know, I often hear about. I don't. Everyone's different. But I, I hear, I see young people get asked in questions now about what is your goals. Oh, I don't really have any goals. I just want to enjoy it and all that. You know what I mean? You should always have goals. You know, because the goals keep moving. You know, they never. You get them, and then, the go, you know, you can never. If you don't have goals, you can never score. You know what I mean? You need to. You know, you need to have that goal. You need to have that target, and you need to be never satisfied with that target. You've, you, like, considering you were champion jockey, twenty times. Mm -hmm. I, I, I read this recently where about you where you were never you never particularly enjoyed it you, you've, you've said you got to the last you tried to win it as soon as you could because you enjoyed yeah. those few weeks because then that last race it's back yeah. to square one and I suppose it's a good trait because it, it kept you going Yeah. but was there any more room that you, or would you change that and I suppose look, the, look. Best, the best players would, would go up time again we see we say for instance with Chelsea man said they can't replicate it the next season because maybe players managers are resting on their laurels a little bit that's, that certainly wasn't the case with you yeah I, I often say that I, I, I've said numerous times that I don't know if I was ever content and, and I've said using the analogy that I didn't really enjoy it but I, I, I must have enjoyed it because it's what drove me mm. and what, what I did enjoy was that little fraction of time where I won and I beat everyone else but when I went out in the next race it was gone mm. and I was looking for that repetitive drug every time I went out and I couldn't get it every time I went out and that's where it was difficult to satisfy but I, I was I content you know I, I don't think I was ever satisfied but I, I did enjoy it I think I you know and for those 20 years you know when I I used to try the jockey's championship was, was all year round it's it's numerical and the only real enjoyment or relief that I got was 
the time when it was numerically possible but no one else could beat me so if I was 50 winners ahead with or 40 winners ahead with a month to go or three weeks to go there wasn't enough races really for someone to beat me yeah. and I could enjoy it for that month but the day that I held up the Jockey Championship trophy in Sandown at the end of the season that was it it was gone it was gone the day as soon as I picked up the trophy in fact the day I went to the races I, I went with this feeling inside me that you know what I'm actually not champion jockey any longer because tomorrow it's back to none. What was it? You just didn't want to give that up. You, so you yeah, didn't want I, anyone else in it to I, get ahead. I didn't want to give that up, and you know what? I liked the enjoyment of beating everyone. Did you? And and <laughs> a lot of sadistic. a lot of a lot of sports people will never admit to it, and it's one of the things you miss now. You miss you miss the ego of beating everyone. You miss the adulation of beating everyone. You miss you know going to the Chatham Festival and winning the Gold Cup in front of seventy thousand people, and people thinking, you know what? He's all right at what he does. Mm. You know. Um, but it, my biggest problem throughout my career was not so much keeping the people I worked with or the people I worked for happy, was keeping me happy. Yeah, you know that's a, you know you have to have, you have to have standards and you have to have goals and and can you as a sports person can you ever be satisfied? Yeah, you can be satisfied for a period of time, but you know I I don't think that I was ever really really satisfied. I do look. I have. I'm lucky that I'm retired now. That I don't have any regrets. I know I didn't take any shortcuts. I know I went racing days when I was in total it's agony from like injuries, and I'd keep going. And you know, so I know I didn't take any shortcuts. Yeah, if I was doing it again, I'd be much better. You know, as I've said it a few times, most of my colleagues said when I retired. You know, when people said, "Oh, he's the winning most jockey of all time. He's ridden four thousand three hundred fifty-seven winners." And one of them piped up and said, "Yeah, but no one's mentioned the fourteen thousand losers that he's ridden." <laughs> You know, so you know, so you're the you know, so I'm the I got reminded quite quickly that I was the losing most jockey of all time. You yeah. know, but but you know, do I have regrets? No, and I'm not sure. You know, and I know that <clears throat> I know there's a few different footballers that, that I'd play with, but I listened to Jimmy and Janice on the TV last week, and he said about you know he regrets that he didn't feel like he didn't fulfil his potential. You know, and. And and a few of his ex teammates had a little bit of a go saying, Sorry, we didn't try a bit harder, but I think he was having a go at himself rather than them, you know, mm. maybe it was it wasn't taken like that by that. No, it, it wasn't taken a lot by that. But look, I I, I I was looking at him and I thought, fair play to you, you know. Mm. You know, if he thought he should have done better. It's a good thing to have. Yeah. You know, why shouldn't you think you should yeah. I think I should have done better. You talk, know, but t- talk to me about the sacrifice and you made one going to England at fifteen. Yeah. I always say about about more so with footballers, I would say it's, it's because of the life that you can have. It's not so much sacrifice for me; it's choices. But yeah. I think one big sacrifice that you certainly made, and I've seen that firsthand, was your diet. I don't yeah. think I could have done that. I really don't. Yeah, like I'm five foot ten, and like not something I'm proud of. Now the day I retired, I was ten stone two. I weighed myself during Royal Ascot this year and I was 12 eight. <laughs> Um I'm a little bit better shape now than I was. I, I think I got through that stage in my life where I just let it go a little too much. I think you're entitled to that. But I have a little bit more discipline now. But there would be days, you know, you'd eat once a day. Certainly going to the Cheltenham Festival and I had plenty of rides. I wouldn't have been eating. I wouldn't have had breakfast or anything like that. I never had breakfast. Obviously, I didn't have lunch because I was riding. Mm. And then I'd probably eat a little bit after after racing, you know. So there was days that you, you didn't eat a lot. There was sacrifices. You travel a lot. Um... But the reality of it is, it didn't work. You know, I, I never done a day's work in my life. I genuinely mean that. Yeah, I was travelling up and down the length and breadth of England every day from the end of October until Christmas Eve, and then, you know, from you'd have you'd have Christmas Day and Stephen's Day off, and then you'd be back till the end the end of May if you didn't get injured. So Do you really have, feel that it wasn't it wasn't work? It wasn't. It was never work. People, really? people. There's there's lads out there working on building sites that are working. You know, that are getting in a van mm. and going off to work. That's work. And and I'm not having to go at your profession, or whatever. But I, I, I agree. With what you're going to say? But I, I I read that you know that you know I listen to TV or a radio station and said oh but you know he's had three games this week and you know he knew. I said three games. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's doing something that any kid on the st- that that any kid for. in the street would yeah. give their left hand for. It's not work. Yeah. It's not the real world. And if they think if any sports person thinks it's the real world, it ain't. Mm. You know and. The sooner people realise that and the sooner they appreciate the fact that, you know what, I'm in a very privileged position, I get to entertain people, I get to live my life because they're paying to come and watch me, you know, 
and the more sports people need to I think uh, me personally I think the more sports people need to appreciate the people mm. that you do get cocooned in a, in a bubble don't, ah, you? I don't look, know you how need much to. it is with horse racing yeah. certainly in a football environment you have no idea and that yeah, I've retired a similar time to yeah. you three, three years ago and around three years ago football now is on to another level yeah. they can't really relate no they can't the man they, on the street no they can't and, and, and look the TV and television rights have, have obviously um, had a huge impact on that but I, I agree with you they can't relate to it but at the same time um, you know I, I do think that they look I, I was the worst because I went to the Chatham Festival I went into Wareham two hours before racing and I was so selfish so self-centred I wouldn't have known if the Pope mm, was out well, watching yeah. side I wouldn't I wouldn't have noticed you know and that's because you become engrossed you become ingrained in what in you and, and in sport I think you have to but there comes a time I think when you you know when you have to give that little moment look I, I appreciate that you know that with the social medias of the world that now that people they can't really have a life they can't really have a bit cautious they have to be a little bit cautious but, but this is a very short period of time in their life and there'll come a time when they'll be like you and me when no one will care what they're doing and they'll be they'll just be another person that played mm. football or rode horses that someone else will be in the position playing for Manchester City or playing for Arsenal or Liverpool or Manchester United mm. you know or Chelsea they'll be taking the position people want to, the young lads of yeah. today will want to talk about him you know you know you look at the sporting icons of people that played football for Ireland the Paul McGraths of this world or whatever you know or the, the great hurlers the great footballers you know the, someone else will come along yeah, they'll come we'll along take that place. will take that place yeah. You speak about when when you're not in that limelight directly. When did you start thinking about retirement? Did you think about it in the build up two, three years, a year before? I remember being in your house on Valentine's night, 2015. Was about a couple of months before you announced your retirement. And yeah. You were kind of alluding to it that night. You were yeah. recording. Yeah. Uh, being AP at the time. That's right. Um, and you were touching on it, but. If I think about it myself, yeah. I was preparing for retirement for years. So, yeah. in terms of, and maybe that made me take my eye off football yeah. a little bit. Maybe I think yeah. and been not as driven, but I was I was always wary of that day. I retire. I need something to do. Mm -hmm. the, the the thing about um, when I think about retiring, when I'd won fifteen jockey championships, I was nearly thirty six. And I set myself this goal to win five more jockey championships. Now, there was a lot of reasons, you know. You know, a friend of mine who was a football agent, he was the one that talked me into doing the documentary, being AP. And you know, he kind of sold it to me that you know that look, my little boy Archie was barely even one. He said he's not going to remember you riding, and you sure you can sell him a tip if you win the Grand National and that, but it ain't going to be the same. You know, this would be a good thing for him to look at in years to come when he can realise that you were a jockey and that what you were lucky enough to achieve. Um, and I thought about it and then I thought about it, you know what, and and this friend of mine who taught me this had no idea I was retiring. You know, he just said, look, it'd be a nice thing to have in years mm -hmm. to come. And I thought about it and I thought, you know what, if I do this and it's my last year riding, I get to a point where I won't be able to turn back. It will come out of my mouth one day that I am retiring and I won't be able to change my mind. And it kind of, that was one of the reasons I did that. But when did I decide five years earlier, at the beginning of my last season, I won the champion hurdle on jet ski in Punchestown for Jesse Harrington. And I went back down to, to the McManus's that night and I was having dinner with JP and Noreen and I think John, their son was there. And I said to JP during dinner, I said, look, JP, I've got something to tell you. I said, I think, and I haven't told anyone this, my wife and all, I said, but, I think this is going to be my last year riding. You know, if I'm lucky enough to win the Jolly Championship, it'll be my 20th year. And, you know, it's just the way I've thought about it for... I had this goal, my, this was my mm -hmm. target. I didn't want to be a sports person that someone said he's not as good as he once was. And I I, I was that kind of person that I never cared when he was. I was actually making sure that I wasn't saying to myself, you're not as good as you once were. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want that to happen. I, I used... You know, I used to use the excuse that I didn't want people to think he's not as good as he was, but I didn't want myself to ever think that I wasn't as good. I didn't want to l get to a point halfway through a season and think, you're gone. You know, you haven't got it anymore. Mm. So it was important for you to go out on a high. So it was important to go out. So I, I you know, I told him and he said, look, you've got to think about these things. And 
and and I, I at the beginning of that year I rode my fastest fiftieth winner ever in a season. I rode my fastest hundredth winner in a season. I came home that night, and I said to my wife, and she heard it in the sports newsroom that I'd ridden my hundred winner, fastest hundred winner, and she goes, "Oh, it's amazing." You know what? I said, "You know what?" She like, I said, I "said You know what?" She said, I said, "I actually think I'm getting better." I said, Did you say that to her? Yeah, I said, "I think this is the first time in my life that I actually think I know. I'm, I actually think I've got it. I've got. I know what I'm doing." And she looked at me and think, you psycho. <laughs> and and I and 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 she actually genuinely looked at me thinking, you're a psycho. And and I, I but I I genuinely because statistically I felt like I had. Yeah. You know, I spent twenty years. But you thought after nineteen years I've got, I've been champion jockey. This now I've got it right. Yeah, now I've got it right. And then it, you know, and I had this thing in my head. I'd go and ride. You know, I'd I'd never ridden three hundred winners in a season. I'd ridden three hundred and seven winners in two thousand and two from January to January. You know, which was probably my greatest achievement. But I hadn't ridden three hundred winners in a season, and I thought this was going to be. I was going to ride my three hundred winner, and I was going to announced I was retiring after I'd done it it would be a great way to retire and he, I rode my fastest 150th winner and then I broke my collarbone and broke a few ribs and punched my lung one evening in Worcester on a Thursday evening and I went back riding on the Monday you know four or five days after doing it because I, I felt like I couldn't have any days off I felt like if I was going to ride 300 winners it's only 65 days in the year you can't have a winner and I couldn't afford to miss a day and Anyway, I did ride three winners and I came back five, four days, five days after and then I got a fall the next day and my collarbone, my whole shot, as you'd expect, someone broken collarbone. No one knew that my body was in as bad a way as it was and, and to be honest, I lost it mentally. Did you? Yeah, I lost it mentally. It was the first time in my life that I went home and thought, because I knew I was retiring at the end of the year, I wasn't going to get what I was wanting. I was on course to ride 200 winners. I went riding like who in the right mind go riding four days after breaking your collarbone and puncturing your lung and, and you know I I, I I I didn't even let my doctor didn't even know what happened to me you know I went I went on the quiet somewhere to so get a doctor. Did you quite often hide things that you had wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah. To yeah. And this was the, this was the last race in Worcester and I'm on a Thursday evening at eight o'clock. I wouldn't get into the ambulance. I wouldn't let them bring me to the hospital. I made, you know, the I I had a f row with my GP who was my doctor at the time I told him if I'm going you're, you're bringing me in your car mm. uh, no one's going to see me going into the hospital and went back riding you know five days later and, I, and, and then when I got when I got the fall my collarbone was like a football I, I lost it mentally I, I, I it was like everything that ever it was like everything had been taken away yeah. it was like you know it was like so I, I just I could, it was the first, I'd say it was the only time in my life because I knew I wasn't getting another chance you know and I, I remember going on holidays for a week and come back thinking it's finished yeah. you know I was still going to be champion jockey because yeah. I was I was, you know that was in October you know that was in October and I was like 70 60 70 winners ahead of everyone else I could nearly have I could nearly have not oh, ridden yeah, again yeah. And, and but it was just mentally I was I was I was finished were I, injuries one of the hardest parts of it throughout because you've in, had a few naughty ones haven't you yeah like I broke my ankle I broke my leg broke my arm my wrist broke my back um, probably, you know, I've fractured a few vertebrae a few times. You're saying these broke as if they're ribs. not particularly <laughs> yeah, big no, injuries. Broke all my ribs, fractured my sternum, punctured my lung, loads, collarbones, cheekbones, all my teeth, you know, so... But, like, it's part of the job. And if you're going to be a jump jockey, you have to... The lads that can't, you know, accept the, the dangers of it, you know, that's where they struggle a bit and the, the, <clears> they, they only last a period of mm. time. The sooner you get it into your thick skull with the obviously the thicker you are the better you are but the thing is as soon as you get it the sooner you get that into your head that you're going to get injured the better because mm -hmm. the reality strikes home quicker and you think you know what I'm supposed to get injured I can't go around you know I said it to Ruby Walsh a few weeks ago you know or a few months ago when he got injured he broke his leg in November and he was you know he was he was in bad off form you know he was getting a little older and he you know he you know he was worried about it I said like why are you worried about it I said like you know as well as I do. I said you haven't had a break for a year and a half or two yeah. years. I said you're riding Comes that many territory. I said like just because you're a little bit older doesn't mean you're going to cause any kind of thought about it. You know what? You know what? You're right. It's no different. How does that affect? Because you've you've been touching go for a, a couple of Cheltenham fe mm. festivals. I pretend you've mentioned Ruby in November mm. broke his leg. How does that affect your build up to the festival? Is it as is it as important? So for instance, if, if I hadn't been playing for three months and then go and play a game, you'd be nowhere near it. How does it affect you as a job? Yeah, it's not a, not a, not as much, you know, not as much. You know, the fitness levels obviously you need to be pretty fit, but 
and there's no it's like playing a football match I say there's nothing like playing a football to match to, be, to replicate it you know I know that he's been in Santry for, for the last sort of two months you know working maybe even longer since he broke his leg he's been in Santry every day you know, you know he's a very dedicated lad look he'll go back to Cheltenham he's he's one of those lads that you know obviously he's to be as good as he has he's worked very hard, hard at it but he has worked and he's the hardest worker of all but he's very natural mm. you know he's he's lucky like he's like a, he's like a messy you know what I mean it's like it just comes easy yeah. to when I don't think he's back in the saddle you know, today. He could probably have, he could probably have got back a week or ten days ago, and 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 I I chatted to him about it and I said, look, what's the point? You know, you give yourself as long as you can, yeah. and it, God forbid if you got another injury, you know, he's riding, you know, in Turles, um today. You think if God if you got an injury, will he give it all the time he could? He done everything the right way. If it doesn't work out, well, it wasn't from taking the chances you shouldn't have taken, but. Look, he's you know he's ridden more winners at the Cheltenham Festival than anyone else. He's the best jockey that I've seen. So are you I'd rather forward? have I'd rather have him on my horse than have him riding against me. Mm. Are you looking forward to Cheltenham next week, or you, do you dread it a little bit now? Do you know what? I don't look forward. To, uh, look, I love horse racing. I love sport. I love elite sport. You know, but I don't. I don't go to Cheltenham the way I used to. I don't think about it. I don't get obsessed with it. I don't get engrossed in it as much as I as do I. You get any buzz about being back there? <laughs> not really. No, do you not? No, I, I love the I love the enjoyment of it, yeah. and I love watching good horses and good jockeys win. But I'm not past the stage yet where I think I couldn't do it. Yeah, which is not that must be hard. Which is not helping me. I don't look and I think, yeah, sure, the likes of Ruby and them lads are brilliant. But I don't look at it and think, do you know what? It was a good job you retired because you 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 definitely couldn't compete anymore. Yeah, and I'm just I'm just not there yet. Look, I love I love watching the champion hurdle and the Gold Cup and all those big races, and I will. But I don't go into it with the same intensity, the same obsession that I had before. Mm. I don't walk in there a couple of hours before racing, go into the and put my racing post down. And the only time I'd be seen during Shetland was when I come out to ride in six races every day and I wouldn't look left or right at what I was doing and I'd go back in again. Now I'm out doing different things for different, you know, I'm an ambassador for William Hill and Albert Bartlett, Johnny Bartlett used to sponsor me, I do stuff for him and obviously working for ITV so a lot of things I'm seeing a lot of things in Cheltenham that I never saw never before seen, yeah. it was like when I went to work uh, as a pundit the first day in ITV uh, or the first day you know when I went to work as a pundit I went to Cheltenham I didn't know where the toilet was because <laughs> I'm not allowed in the way room you know I mean? I'm thinking like you know I've been going I've been coming here since 1995 yes. 1994 was the first time in Cheltenham October 94 was the first time in Cheltenham I didn't know where the toilet was outside <laughs> you know and then all of a sudden you're 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 in the toilet beside just I don't mean I'm not meaning this in an arrogant way but regular punters yeah, are asked about racing yeah. I'm thinking oh god I was never like this before I was having to talk to people about what I was doing dose of reality you know dose of reality you know where do you get a cup of tea yeah what so, horse are you most looking forward to seeing next week um, look I'd like to see I think Bouvedere will hopefully win the champion hurdle for, for JP and Noreen you know that would be you know they're great supporters of the game I'd, I'd love to see him when he'd be the gold cup is such a, an open race I think Altier will win the champion chase and that look, the rest of them are, are pretty open races. But if I was picking one horse out, you know, I'd I'd I'd, I'd pick. I'd like to see um, Bouvedere win the champion. Or I'd like to see. There's a lad Nick Gifford trains a horse of JP's called Did They Leave You Out Too. I'd like to see him win too because I, I know that, you know, look, JP is a, you know, JP and Noreen are great supporters of the game and great supporters of, you know, they have horses with the Willie Mullins and the Garden and so forth. But they have horses with a lot of other smaller trainers. Mm. And they have horse with Nick Gifford in England, and I think I think JP personally and would get as much satisfaction, satisfaction of that. of that horse winning as mm -hmm. he would any of the others. I'm not saying he will win because the bumpers are very open race mm -hmm. in England, but I reckon if he won, other than winning the champion, he'd get as much satisfaction, you know, because he, you know, that's the sort of man he is. So I'd, I'd like to see did they leave you out too in the bumper. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to a bit of football chat. I know you're a massive Arsenal fan. It's torture. No, I'm not a an Arsenal fan. <coughs> Excuse me. It's torture. And they do my head in. Mm. So, I, as driven as you are, knowing you the way I do, and how stubborn you are, certainly yeah. one thing you've got in common with Arsene Wenger. Mm. I I became I you know I became an Arsenal fan. I was five when Arsenal won the 1979 FA Cup. I had a lot of friends who were or sorry. I had two cousins who were Man United fans who were older than me. So you went the other way. Yes, and my dad then had told me about the Arsenal team that had Pat Jennings and Liam Brady and Frank Stable, and then you know there was a there was a good crew of Irish people in that team, um, and I went the other way because Arsenal won, you know, um, and I became an Arsenal fan then because of 
Pat Jennings and Liam Brady or nothing. I look through the periods of times as the team look in the last at the beginning of Arsenal Wenger's reign Arsenal were very lucky that you know we had a, a back four that was probably the best back four probably yeah. in, in English football um, and that developed and then you get to the point where the in, the Invincibles in 2003 2004 you know they were a big physical well organised team you know that had, had obviously Tony Adams had just retired but there was a lot of there was a lot of that structure still, still there you know nice. we had Saul Campbell you know Martin Keown Ashley Cole yeah. Lauren um, Seaman still behind that you know and then you had you know our, our midfield whether it was Gilberto or Edu but it was you know um, Vieira obviously Perez Burkamp Henri Lundberg you know with the exception of Lundberg all those and uh, the exception of Lundberg and Ashley Cole they were all big lumps you know I remember Danny Murphy telling me that the first time he went to Highbury you know, he looked back and he said to Steve Jackson, look at the size of these lads, yeah. you know? Um, and that's Wind that on five, six years. You know, they were like, a, they were like he went a Barcelona types, didn't he, in terms of his recruitment. Y- yeah. I, th- I find it quite sad when I see him on the touchline now, I see him getting grilled in press conferences yeah. because I'm with you in terms of he transformed English Arsenal. Football. Yes, yeah. English football. He was he was on a pedestal for yeah. coaches, managers, aspiring to play the way Arsenal were yeah. playing. But he, for me, he didn't evolve. He didn't evolve in the way Sir Alex evol- evolved. Yeah. Getting coaches in, trusting them, trusting people to do jobs underneath him and him just and, managing. And let them make the decisions. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. And and look, it, it's happened. You know, look, people would say, look, he's won three of the last five FA Cups or whatever it is. You think that's that's relatively, you know, if you were, if you were Liverpool... Um, or Tottenham, you'd say, God, that's great success, yeah. isn't it? But there, but Arsenal is not Liverpool or Tottenham. You know, Arsenal should be competing with Manchester United, and obviously Liverpool haven't won a Premier League title for for quite a long time. Um, but do I look at do I look at them? And I think you know, at the moment, I, I think the great thing about football is I remember George Graham when he took over Arsenal, and they asked him, "What is he thinking?" He goes, "I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm taking over a bunch of so and sos that got the last fella sacked." You know what I mean? And that's what's going to happen. And whatever happens when Arsenal at time does, when Arsenal Wenger does go, I hope the next man comes in and, and thins them out pretty quick. Mm. You know, because I'm not sure that a lot of them, there's some of them, look, it's easy for us to sit here and slag footballers there, but I don't know that some of them are just quite good enough to be playing for Arsenal. Mm. And some of them have made little, and, and he's the one that carries the can. You know, you look at the mistake that. You know, professionalism is about an elimination of mistakes. That's what it is. And if you look at the mistakes, you know that Mustafi made against, I'd be disappointed. I'm not. I'm a terrible footballer, but I'd be disappointed if I let, you know, a, li- a little like nudge and a little lad that's five foot five nudge yeah. me off the ball. You know, I, can you imagine Martin Keown or Tony Adams? Or Just wouldn't you know, happen, would it? Wouldn't happen. He'd be, you know, he'd know he was behind him for a yeah. start. You know, so those. those they keep happening though so there's a reason why they keep happening yeah. and the personnel that you recruit so it's a, it is a bit of a vicious circle and as Martin Pipe said to me once and whoever it was said it before him you know the definition of stupidity is someone that does the same thing over and over again, again. and expects a different result yeah. you know so things have to change you know the you know and I and I love Arsene Wenger and all but you know there comes a time when you think you know what and, and I think he deserves you know, he deserves to enjoy his last period of time as a football manager and the way it's going at the moment, as an Arsenal football manager, the way it's going at the moment, that's not happening. Mm. You know, so if they said, by the way... Can he go upstairs, do you think? I, I don't see why not. You know, but I think if they decide now, they said, by the way, they come out in six weeks' time and say, Arsene Wenger is going to be stepping down at the end of the season and let the fans give him, give him the respect that he deserves... But the way it's going at the moment, they're losing respect, mm. you know, and they're losing respect because they're not winning. And whether the sad reality of it is that is what sport is all about. And the book stops, you know, it's like if you're sailing the ship, there's only one fella that's going to sink it and, and he's carrying the can. Mm. So I just want to tell a little story about when you came in, you very kindly came into MK Dons when I was coaching there. We were trying to get promotion at the time from mm-hmm. from League One. And I've always said that there's very talented footballers at League One, at Championship level, talent-wise, some of them are the same as yeah. Premier League players. But the difference is what goes on between the head. And there was a player who I remain nameless yeah. was working with at the time, and I was trying to curb him, trying to coach him, trying to nurture him because I'd been through it. I'd gone off the boil in my playing career, so I was trying to impart that 
knowledge that I had onto yeah. him and spent so much time trying to get him through that stage you couldn't believe it you couldn't believe that somebody with a talent which he was very very talented wasn't willing to apply himself you found that very very hard to believe didn't you well you know that's probably how long ago six years ago is it whatever long ago three, three years it's only three years yeah. about it, three years ago but uh, you know that same person like I, I don't even know where he is now mm. you know and I'm looking at I'm, I'm looking at him thinking does he realise the regrets he's going to have but then you said he might not even realise that yet no, I don't think you so. know and that's that's the unfortunate part but he was in a very privileged position where he could have made something I most certainly wasn't the most talented jockey you know I'd never for one minute the only time that I ever thought I was the best jockey and I don't mind saying it now when I'm retired was when I was on a horse I actually genuinely felt I convinced myself whether it was or it wasn't I genuinely convinced myself I was the best when I was on earth now when I got off it I was so insecure I was so I lived in fear I, I looked and thought God I could be so much better I'm not as good as you know so I never had doubts when I was on a horse and I, and I feel if I went on a football field I'd never have doubts when I got off it but even after 5, 10 uh, jockeys, I, you would still feel like that yeah a little bit yeah I, I'd feel that you know what someone's going to beat me and then I'd then I'd ride more winners like I, I, I broke Sir Gordon Richard's record in 2002 I'd been champion jockey seven or eight times whatever it was six or seven times and I kind of felt that do you know what if I can ride this many winners someone else can you know what I mean so I was always like well, if I can do it and that's when I just to go back what I said when I rode my fastest 100 winner in my last year riding I didn't know where I got enjoyment from it or whether it annoyed me the fact that I was 40 and that I'd actually done something that I couldn't do for 20 years. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm a 40 year old and I can do it. Some little <laughs> pup is definitely going to, and that, 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 that really <laughs> worried, on that really worried me. But you go back to the, the lad that you said that you were coaching, he must, he, there will come a period in his life or a time in his life where he will have regrets. You know, I, I certainly didn't think I was the most talented. I genuinely thought I was the best worker. Now, in other lads would think there's good work as mm. well, but I definitely work my best. I'll tell you what I, I use quite often to... So I've coached uh, the Irish underage teams the last couple of years, and they obviously see Ronaldo, Messi, mm. you know, that usual debate, who's the better player, blah, blah, blah. I say to them, what do you think of Wayne Rooney? Mm. He's crap. I said, OK, go back 15 years, 12, 15, four, whatever years ago. Rooney and Ronaldo were yeah. fairly similar in yeah. terms of where their stature at Man United at the yeah. time. One player devoted his life yeah. to being a footballer and being the absolute best he can be yeah. and he's ended up smashing all kinds of records Wayne Rooney still had a very very good career yeah. but I think he will have regrets yeah possibly you know Rooney was a very naturally talented lad <clears throat> and I still look at him now and I, and I you know I, I think Rooney was a brilliant footballer because I watched him play and, and you watch him even now he can play balls into areas without even looking because mm. he knows that's Gifted. where it, that he's got a lot of natural talent you look at the physique of Ronaldo and you think yeah maybe he might be a bit vain and whatever but you don't get in that position looking like that without being a you know being a professional mm. in every way you know his diet his diet his fitness his regime is obviously dedicated to being the best footballer in the world and that's not a coincidence you know and you look at how many footballers and yeah sure whatever it may be a little vain or whatever it is and you know he may love himself but how many footballers would pull their shirt off and think you know and whether you like it or not sport is all about, like life is all about opinions everyone's got them mm. everyone's got them but statistics don't lie you know and statistics will tell you that you know that Ronaldo and Messi you know are have broke all the stats and, and it's they're out of time who's your favourite? I'll tell you who I think my favourite footballer of all time was. I'd, I'd love to say George Best. I met him a few times, and he was a he was a little bit of a legend. Or Liam Brady. I honestly think that what Diego Maradona did to win a World Cup with Argentina, pretty much on his it's own, pass, is it? was and it's not because Messi hasn't won the World Cup, but what he did at Napoli to win mm. Serie A when Serie A was probably the best league in the world. It was probably a better league than than La Liga is yeah. now or the Premier League. Mm. You know, he won at Serie A with Napoli when they never won. They never looked like winning a game of football beforehand. They're a little bit better recently, but they haven't won a Serie A since. 
he won Syria on his own mm. as a footballer, and I don't care what anyone says. That you know, not just because he did it on an international stage, but he did it domestically as well. Did it domestic, no domestically, domestically. And look, people would you look. Know, he, he you, you you speak about Ronaldo. Diego Maradona was looked at everything that a professional footballer. You know, he, he shouldn't. <laughs> but in terms of a, in, in terms of an achievement. You know, I think, and you can talk about Pelly who played in the great teams, or George Bessler, but he genuinely, I think, won two. He won two championships. He won a world champ. He won a world cup, and a team that it, that mm-hmm. he carried, and he won a domestic title with a team that was in the best league in the world at the time on his own, mm-hmm. and he proved it because they've never won before or since. You know, you look at the Manchester United, or the Real Madrid, or the Barcelona's that they've all gifted individuals or gift, you know they've got as uh, teams. Yeah. So. So you got who's, my, who's my favourite Ronaldo or Messi hmm. you've added that one quite nicely I did who's my favourite um, who would you uh, I wouldn't have a clue it's not it's not split it's not fair you know yeah. Messi can do things with a ball that you know you see him dribbling around like, Man- like Ronaldo scores great headers and he you know and, and so, but Messi can dribble from one end one of the football the pitch to the other and still score mm. if you if you got a selection of their 10 best goals Messi's best 10 goals would be better than Ronaldo's mm-hmm. best 10 goals no. I'm taking Messi down as the answer yeah I think so I think just Messi <laughs> listen I don't want to take up any more time I know you're a busy man I really really appreciate you coming in I know everything about football and horse racing now <laughs> don't they <laughs> <laughs> people are going to listen to me and thinking God well, what an opinion it like so and so he is it's been an absolute uh, pleasure really really appreciate you coming cheers. in and I Thanks. hope you do enjoy some parts of next week at Cheltenham oh yeah I will I'll enjoy it more than people think hey P thanks very much cheers thanks that was AP McCoy what a man what a man <coughs> firstly he's great company he's very very sharp witted funny fella yeah what a sportsman well he, he, he spoke about the favourite football De- Diego Maradona thinks the best of all time well he is the best yeah, of all time no, that's the thing no, isn't no, it no. you know you, you, um, you might have missed a little part of that where he, he made me kind of think did he just say that he said in his 20th uh, year so he'd had 19 champion jockeys under his belt yeah. and then he started the 20th so well he went home and he said to his wife Chanel I think I've cracked it now I think <laughs> I've cracked it and I was like it took you 19 years really <laughs> 19 years of winning so, every year yeah, as well so driven uh, his, his success is, is phenomenal it mm. really is and you, you it, and that was the thing I don't know if you, if you caught the documentary uh, was it Bean AP or yeah. AP it, it, was, it was a phenomenal documentary him and him and his wife and the dynamics mm-hmm. in their relationship and the pressure that I think all sportsmen and sportswomen put on the families in general it, yeah. it's true and you could see the tension when he was on about th- he was thinking about maybe carrying on and mm-hmm. when he was going to retire and it, it, it was a lot of pressure on him during that spell but you need only to look at him I, I think even I mean you said the last couple of years you mentioned they're going to Cheltenham earlier on I love going to Cheltenham but it does seem strange to me without him without, without, without AP yeah. riding that's yeah. the thing but stranger he's, to him ah, he's, he's a genius yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think it probably still kills yeah. him every yeah. single time absolutely yeah. absolutely kills him he's a massive Arsenal fan we'll touch on them tonight playing AC Milan Yeah, you were just mentioning you wouldn't surprise you if they, if they get through this AC Milan are exactly pulling up any Trees. They're on a great run, aren't they? Gattuso's doing great with mm. AC Milan. I think since December they're unbeaten, mid-December they're mm. unbeaten now. So, yeah, the form suggests that AC Milan probably will get through it, but how strong is the best of the rest mm. in in, um, in Syria? Outside Juve and, Splash and, and Napoli. in the last summer, yeah. AC Milan. They have underachieved. And yeah. You're right, they are on a good run, but like something needs to give now for, for Arsenal. Isn't it? This is everything... Yeah is in this competition now well exactly I mean, has to be AC Milan will probably look at maybe a, a performance like Brighton at the weekend and think if you if you sit deep be strong defensively yeah. get bodies behind the ball they do struggle to break that down mm. that's what I would imagine AC Milan would probably do over the two legs and say they sh- AC Milan are probably slight favourites mm. probably overall but I could just see Arsenal getting some sort of bounce in this one and uh, and producing some sort of real result I think they'll get through one other player which we, we made a bit of a mess up earlier was Alan Brown um, we yeah. sidetracked a little bit but you can tell me it was me that made the balls of it it's alright I wouldn't show you under the bus like that like sitting, it's, it's all right. sitting in this chair at times yeah um, He's done very, very well this season. At yeah. times, played as a 10, a real a different type of number 10. A bit, a bit like the way Jeff Hendrick plays at Burnley, running in behind uh, centre-forwards they come short. Mm. Pure energy, nice physical presence. But mm. if you look at his goal the other night, the confidence in which he's playing with a little dink over the goalkeeper, I'm delighted yeah. he's also 
been given a crack at whip because he's probably not seen as maybe the most fashionable fashionable type player yeah uh, don't do this the wrong way playing in an unfashionable club yeah. um, he's taking us to promotion Keith well no you're offense in, for promotion you're, the, this year. you're certainly in the hunt yeah but I, I am genuinely happy that he's been he's been yeah. given a crack you four, four P&E right, plays in the squad anyway that's, that can't that can't be said every time I tell you yeah. but no uh no, like with, with, with Al, I've known him since I was 15, that's the thing, and I've told you probably the story before, I had him over no, to Hull. Have you not? Well, no. no, we got him into Hull when he was 15. So, John Fallon, who we would have been scouting yeah. over here, rang me up, Johnny, and said, look, Kev, I've got this lad I saw playing for Ringmahan Rangers down in Cork, I think he's excellent, have a look. He was actually playing for the, for the it was um, uh, like a, a homegrown international yeah, yeah, game, you know, one of the homegrown yeah, yeah. games, yeah. he saw him playing. Anyway, came over to Hull and we would have had Robbie Brady who had been on loan from Man United yeah. at the time. I was coaching the 21s. Anyway, made a massive impression. He was he, he looked so good. He was so much better than what we what they had at that age. He was 15 or 16 at the time. Yeah. First first tackling training when he came up to train with the first team. He goes through yeah, Robbie yeah. Brady. He nailed Robbie Brady like and you think straight away this kid you're thinking, "Yes, I'm having him." So, the end of the week goes by and I spoke to the youth team manager at the time there and Ring Mahan wanted two and a half thousand euros up front oh, 5,000 euros in general it probably would have been it probably would have worked out about a 10,000 deal wouldn't it was it was minimal amount of money that they wanted for especially when you factor and to in refer to recruitment's been really good as, exactly as late, isn't it? and if you look at well, Ring Mahan look, wanted to look after him and that's not always the case that I'd, I'd spoke to spoke to guys down there and they said look we want we want to give Al the chance. Yeah. We think he's good enough. We give him the chance, and it was basically giving him the chance to go over and play in England. And anyway, the club turned it down. I was gutted. With not long after that, mm. he went and signed. He actually signed for Cork City. Uh, then didn't play, I don't think he played for Cork City, but then went yeah, on to Preston, Preston not long after, and. He's gone. He's get. He keeps getting better and better. I saw him play a couple of under twenty one games. After that, he was. He did brilliantly for the under twenty ones. Of course, now ineligible for, for the twenty ones. And now he's getting to the stage where I think now he's. I think he's twenty three now, Alan. And he's getting to the stage now where you think he can go on now to that yeah. next level. He needs to maybe take control of games a little bit yeah. more. He's probably got to move the ball a little bit quicker at times. But um, he's constantly improving, though, isn't he? He's get, well, that's the thing. Every every, every single he's season, he's and he's playing in a different position as well. I've bumped into his family actually doing a couple of pressing games. And, and at a golf tournament down in Cork last year they were great cracks so I'm sure they'll be looking forward to him anyway, yeah. again he's getting better and better he's probably not at the level where he may, you maybe see he's going to be ahead of Jeff Hendrick and Harry Archer at the moment yeah. but I think deserves to be in the squad potential he's definitely there with Alan yeah, yeah definitely yeah, very much so look that's all we got time for uh, you can catch the podcast on the usual off the ball uh, YouTube stroke off the ball uh, we'll post a full AP interview up as well on a separate podcast for you so you can have a little read back of that we'll be back next Thursday well, thanks to Kevin thanks for coming Come in Kevin. and we will see you next Thursday <laughs>